Good afternoon. I'm truly excited to introduce the next speaker, Ms. Rose Gottemaler. Rose Gottemaler is a lecturer at Stanford University's Institute for International Studies. Before joining Stanford, Gottemaler served as Deputy Secretary General of NATO from 2016 to 2019, where she helped to drive forward NATO's adaptation to new security challenges in Europe and the fight against terrorism. Prior to NATO, she served for nearly five years as the Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security at the U.S. Department of State, advising the Secretary of State on arms control and nonproliferation. She was the chief U.S. negotiator of the New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, also known as New START with the Russian Federation. And prior to her government service, she was a senior associate with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She served as the director of Carnegie Moscow Center from 2006 to 2008 and is currently a non-resident fellow in Carnegie's nuclear policy program. At Stanford, Gautamaler teaches and mentors students in the Master's in International Policy program, contributes to policy research and outreach activities, and convenes workshops, seminars, and other events on nuclear security, Russian relations, the NATO alliance, EU cooperation, and nonproliferation. Ms. Gautamaler, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Griffin. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. It's great to be back here. I was here two years ago for the summit meeting at that time, and it was an absolutely great opportunity. But at that point, Russia had just invaded Ukraine. And I recollected John Rose's role and the track two activities that we heard about today and how important they were so many years ago at bringing the fall of the wall and bringing you know, freedom and liberty as we've been discussing in every session today to the countries of the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Sadly, two years on, the situation is still dire and even more dire, I would say, today. So I think we need to, again, invoke the spirit of John Rose and Karen Rose, his wife, in our discussions today and in thinking about your work here at the College of Charleston and the Global Leadership Institute founded under the name of John Ed Edwin Murrow's very, very important work that you are all doing here, and I thank you for it. And I mentioned that I would be willing to talk uh, to uh, you all about uh, the notion of diplomacy and cooperation without trust, responding to Russia's nuclear threat. When Max Kavlyov and I discussed it some months ago, it seemed like, okay, this is something that we really need to keep working on. And I, I will talk about that this morning, but it is a difficult week to do so because we have just passed this second anniversary of Russia's all-out invasion of Ukraine, and Russia is beginning to press a new offensive now against the northeast part of the country, the city of Kharkiv, which is the tech center of Ukraine. It's Ukraine's Silicon Valley. And we're also seeing pressure in the south. So the Ukrainians are up against it now. And that is extraordinarily uh, difficult to see when we know the aid and assistance that should be going to them is not getting to them at the moment. I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. And moreover, the Kremlin is back to rattling the nuclear saber. They did it when they first invaded the country, and then it fell back a bit. But now they're rattling the nuclear saber again. Putin flew this week in a Tu-160M blackjack bomber. I was happy to see he had his shirt on this time. But he also sat with Minister of Defense Shoigu. And they talked about the invasion of Ukraine, but they also talked about this new satellite weapon that's supposed to be out there and capable of denying the United States command and control and destroying our satellites in space. And if you look at the, the film, it's very cleverly done. Shoigu and Putin are looking at a map of the United States of America as they have this discussion. So they're always very good at propaganda and especially good on this occasion. Furthermore, now Dmitry Medvedev, he's former president of the country. He, in fact, is the president that Barack Obama signed the New START Treaty with back in 2010. But he's now turned into chief propagandist. He's deputy national security advisor. 
but he's uh, loving the nuclear saber rattling. He put out a list this week of the cities that Russia would bomb with nuclear weapons if it had to. First on the list, Berlin, next London, third Washington. He also said attempts at negotiated arms control had exhausted themselves. Russia, the nuclear bully. There's no question that's the message that the Kremlin wants out there right now. It's different than the message that was out there and that we have sustained since the Cuban Missile Crisis. That is, no matter what, the United States and the USSR, now Russia, must work to avoid a nuclear holocaust. That is, after all, a potential extinction event for humanity. We kept up nuclear negotiations even in the darkest days of the Cold War, even during the Vietnam War, when Russian pilots, Russian, I saw, I'm sorry, air defense guys were helping to shoot down American pilots over Hanoi. And Senator John McCain knew that story very, very well. So it's different now, though, uh, because essentially Putin is saying no more nuclear negotiations as long as you are assisting Ukraine. So they've drawn up a linkage and made it impossible now to negotiate with them on constraining and controlling nuclear weapons. So in these circumstances, what can be done? Jim Story said just a few moments ago, we need to keep creating dilemmas for autocrats. And I absolutely agree with that. We need to keep uh, creating dilemmas for Putin. He's trying to duck his nuclear responsibility, that responsibility of preventing an extinction event for humanity. First, I would say we should look for places where, where we can confirm and reconfirm nuclear restraint. We should do everything we can to avoid a nuclear arms race, especially now when China has begun to modernize its nuclear forces and is building up its nuclear forces. So despite Medvedev saying that nuclear negotiations are exhausted, we should continue to reaffirm that we will stay within the limits of the New START Treaty, which Putin announced he, he would no longer implement, that is, he'd no longer exchange information or allow our inspectors to come into his country, but he would stay within the limits of New START, which are uh, five, uh, sorry, 1,550 warheads and 700 delivery vehicles. Those are missiles and bombers that carry the nuclear warheads. So Putin said he's willing to maintain those limits, and President Biden has said that as long as Russia maintains those limits, so will the United States. So we need to restate again and again our willingness to restrain nuclear weapons. Second, we have to be the ones maintaining the moral high ground. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan last June announced that we are ready at any time to resume nuclear negotiations without preconditions, and he stressed without preconditions. It's Putin who has laid down preconditions, as I said, saying we must cease all our assistance to Ukraine or no more nuclear arms control. So I'm sorry, <laughs> when we're talking about preventing nuclear holocaust and an extinction event for humanity, we need to keep talking about restraining and controlling nuclear weapons, no matter what. That's the moral high ground, and we need to sustain it. Third, we should look for areas where the Russians and we still have an interest, such as preventing the deployment of medium range missiles in Europe. These missiles, if deployed in NATO countries, can get to targets in Russia with very, very little warning, little or no warning. And so they pose a special threat to Moscow and the command and control of the leadership in Moscow. So they're alarming to Putin and his Kremlin. Moscow, by the way, if such missiles are deployed uh, in Moscow or in Russia, rather, then they can attack all the NATO capitals from the Norwegian capital, Oslo, in the north, all the way to the Spanish capital, Madrid, in the south. So for that reason, also NATO has an interest in controlling such missiles. Vladimir Putin did put a proposal on the table in October 2020 for a moratorium on deployment of such missiles in Europe. And so I think we both have an interest in, my, in this matter. And my experience is that no arms control negotiation can be successful unless both sides have an interest in the matter. So I say, let's, let's look for areas where we both have an interest and try to work on it. 
Fourth, we need to make Russia think twice about China. The Chinese are building up from a very low base, but very quickly, modernizing their whole nuclear arsenal. Right now, we estimate that they have fewer than 500 nuclear warheads total. But by 2035, our Defense Department says they could have as many as 1,500. So that's a rapid buildup. They're also quickly building up the missiles to deliver them. Of course, the Russians will never admit that they're worried about the Chinese, and the Chinese will not admit that they're worried about the Russians. But um, they did nearly come to nuclear blows in the late 1960s over a border dispute. So I think that um, we can get the Russians to think twice by developing the kind of nuclear dialogue with the Chinese that will allow us to understand what the Chinese are up to and to make a case to them that restraining and constraining nuclear weapons is better than building them up and engaging in a nuclear arms race. We're on the right track beginning with some talks on nuclear disarmament and nonproliferation right before President Biden and President Xi met in California in late November. So the more we're having active nuclear dialogue with the Chinese, the more it's going to make the Russians think twice that we are beginning to develop the kind of productive relationship with the Chinese that led to 70 years of arms control, limitation, control, and restraint reductions with the Soviet Union and afterwards with the Russian Federation. That's before, of course, Putin cut off these talks and these discussions because of Ukraine. So make no mistake, that long process over 70 years had a lot of ups and downs, but it was ultimately successful in constraining nuclear weapons, bringing numbers down from a high, well, when the START Treaty was signed in 1994, we had 12,000 deployed nuclear warheads. We in the United States and the Russian Federation, each of us had 12,000 deployed nuclear warheads. And the numbers came down and down and down until under the new START treaty, which has been enforced since 2011, we have 1,550 deployed nuclear warheads. That's still a lot of warheads. That's why I say we still have to keep working, chipping away at this problem, reducing, limiting, and constraining. So let's get back to China and see what we can do uh, in order to develop that kind of special relationship that we evolved over many years working with the USSR and the Russian Federation. Let's get talking to China in the same way. And I believe that the Russians are not going to like it. So that's why I say we need to get the Russians to think twice about what we are willing to do in talking to the Chinese. So as I prepare to wrap up now, and I'll look forward to taking your questions, I'm gonna move over there to make it a little more of an informal conversation. Also, I recognize, you know, you may have questions if you're interested in European politics, talking about NATO, talking about some of the other subjects that I work on, I'll be happy to, to try to tackle those questions. But as I prepare to wrap up, I wanted to comment on the second anniversary yesterday of Russia's second invasion of Ukraine. The first being when they seized Crimea in 2014 and destabilized the Donbass, the, the eastern provinces of Ukraine. I've been thinking about this anniversary a lot. I've been thinking about it as I've been walking around Charleston. I walked across Marion Square yesterday and I thought, oh, Francis Marion, the swamp fox himself. Um, you know, he relied on cunning localized knowledge and improvised weapons to outsmart, outmaneuver, and eventually defeat the British during our War of Independence. It's what we call today guerrilla tactics, although I've read that Marion learned these tactics from the, the Cherokees. We're seeing exactly the same thing from the Ukrainians against a huge onslaught of Russian armor and Russian personnel everything that the Russians are throwing at them. They are using cunning, localized knowledge and improvised weapons. And in some cases having enormous success, they have essentially shut the Russians out of the Western part of the Black Sea. They are defeating the mighty Russian Navy with what I call their Mosquito Navy. Improvised weapons, including delivered by Zodiacs and by guys on jet skis, 
and using their own indigenous missile capability and capacity. They were great missileers. They are great missileers. They built the huge ICBMs during the Soviet era, two big missile plants in Ukraine. They know missiles, and they're using that indigenous knowledge now in order to shut the Russians out of the Black Sea. And that's very impressive. Everybody knows about the stalemate on the battlefield, but sea control is in the hands of the Ukrainians now. They've also been denying the Russians air superiority. Not all the time. The Russians are obviously shooting big missiles at them, but the Russians are not operating their aircraft or their helicopters in Ukrainian airspace that means they have limitations to how much success they can have on the ground without persistent air superiority. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention because I like to think of the Ukrainians fight in terms of our own war of independence. We were massively outnumbered, but we were smart enough and committed enough to beat the British anyway. Francis Marion is a great symbol of that fight. We need to remember him as we think about Ukraine's struggle with Russia today. It's all about being the smartest and the most cunning and the most committed in the end of the day to liberty. So I'm gonna leave my formal remarks at that and move over there and I look forward to your questions. Questions? Oops, there's one right there. Thank you so much. Um, I'm teaching a course right now, Russia in the World, and so I'm quite fascinating by, I'm fascinated by this com these comments. And um, a persistent thread throughout all the presentations so far has been the need to engage the other side and continue talking. And I'm just curious how much you can say about how much talking we are doing with the Russians nowadays. Um, I had an interesting conversation last week with a colleague about uh, Car uh, Tucker Carlson's interview with Putin and how much uproar there was about um, sort of the fact that he interviewed the Russian dictator. Um, and my point was that we need to talk, even if you don't disagree. I mean, you don't agree with the other side, you still have to listen, right? And so I'm just curious what you can say about the nature of our relations with Russia behind the scenes, if there are any, and, and uh, how much talking we're actually doing. Yeah, my answer will draw uh, back to the thread of our earliest discussions uh, this morning when we were talking about uh, the Moroz Institute and talking about track two diplomacy because it is a very important aspect of how we are communicating with the Russians right now. Um, I myself am involved in, in uh, a couple of track twos, uh, one under the aegis of the National Academies of Sciences. Um, and these are, you know, as, as most track twos are, uh, you are ex-government officials, people who have worked in the government still have links on both sides but uh, it's not the government's directly involved. If it gets to, this is a little bit of insider jargon, but if it gets to track 1.5, that means you're edging closer to having a government full up negotiation on track one. You have government people in the room, but track two is only people who are uh, former government people. And so uh, the discussions have been very rich, but I have to say, I've noticed on the Russian side, a, a little bit of, frankly, despair right now, despair not emanating from the, uh, the stance that we as US experts are taking, but from the stance uh, they're, they're getting back from their interlocutors in the Russian government. So the idea is, you know, you're talking together as former experts, you go back and report to your government and keep them apprised of ideas that are developing, trying to think about preparing the way for when things get better and we can get back to active diplomacy. Um, but there's a little bit of despair now on the Russian side that this situation is going to change quickly and the, the distaste in the Kremlin for dealing with the United States is going to remain there. So it's a little bit discouraging, but I think we have to continue to, 
roll those rocks uphill anyway. And I will also say that I know that there are uh, continuing behind the scenes discussions, and we've already heard the remark this morning that the uh, Jim story made it a few moments ago. Confidentiality is really important, and some of the most productive discussions are the quiet behind the scenes discussions. Uh, Tony also mentioned Bill Burns in Paris today, those kinds of, he's a master. So those kinds of quiet behind the scenes discussions uh, also continue between Washington and Moscow. Uh, thank you very much for your, your remarks. Um, been a lot of press recently about Russian interference in various elections and the current um, situation where the FBI seems to have dropped the ball on this Smirnoff character who's apparently been a double agent for more than a decade. How, how did we drop the ball so badly on that? Well, I think we do the best we can. Certainly the FBI does the best they can, but um, it's not always possible uh, to perform at 100% in all circumstances just because of incomplete information and, and so forth and so on. But I know they, they try to do the best they can. Uh, as far as interference in elections, that's just part of the, the Moscow playbook now. And I'd say more broadly, the autocrats playbook, if they have the tools available and, and the way that social media are so available once again. Uh, we've been talking about that over and over this morning. Uh, it, it, uh, it kind of supercharges the ability to meddle. And so I think we have to say that this is something that not only Moscow is up to, but also China and uh, Iran, even North Korea. I think we just have to be very, very aware of that. I'm quite alarmed now with the advent of, of generative AI and the ability to, to mimic politicians. We saw the situation uh, in the primary up in New Hampshire with the voice of, of President Biden being mimicked in a, in a voice message over the, over the phone telling people not to vote. So those are the kinds of examples uh, that are already out there. And I think they should be a huge wake up call to all of us to be very critical in our thinking uh, as we're approaching the ballot box. And if we're hearing something that doesn't sound quite right, to make sure we check in with the election authorities in our state and say, hey, I just got this phone call or whatever, uh, you know, what's up? Because I think it's, it's we're gonna have to take responsibility ourselves. Uh, for uh, ensuring the the vitality and also, I think, uh, the legitimacy of the voting process. That gets beyond your question, but I did want to voice that concern about generative AI. So I wanted to bring up the fact that throughout Europe, we're maybe seeing an increase like this wave of conservatism and especially maybe more isolationist approaches to foreign policy from a lot of European nations. And I wanted to ask you maybe what um, the implications of that could be, especially when we're considering nuclear threat so close um, with Russia and kind of how that like changed isolationism might affect um like that decision by Russia, I think we're seeing uh, we're seeing a, a confluence of of trends going on. By the way, I think if you've been watching what's been going on with the uh, the farmers in Poland, for example, blocking the borders with Ukraine, part of that is that they are very very frustrated with some of the uh, the drops in prices that have occurred because there's been a glut of grain on the market because of good harvest, but also because Ukraine has actually kept their production up and they've been shipping through through Europe and some of it's gotten dumped on those markets. But that you know kind of violent swing in the farm community uh, throughout Europe, and it's not only in uh, in Poland, but also in France and elsewhere, I understand has partially come about because of, again, this meddling that is going on and emanating from, from Moscow, getting, you know, opinions spun up in this particular area. So again, we just have to be, you know, as individuals, very, very attuned to that, but also governments have to do their best to address the misinformation and disinformation that's out there. Uh, the other thing, though, um, I would say that I said there's there's kind of a confluence of trend lines here. Uh, 
the um, invasion of Ukraine uh, by the Russian Federation, the second invasion that took place in 2022 after the first one in 2014, that actually uh, led to a, a, a real spark in cohesion in the NATO alliance and also among European Union countries. And you're seeing it in the way that they have been uh, delivering assistance to Ukraine and throughout all this period, new sanctions even this week out of the European Union, uh, a, a coherence there that has simply been remarkable from my perspective, from my time spent at, at NATO 2016 to 19. You know, there were constantly problems in and among the allies. So there's a coherence there that's very powerful, but there are also political trends heading in the other direction. And we'll see how that plays out at the ballot box across Europe in the next year. 2024 is a, is a hugely important election year, not only here in the United States, but also across Europe. And, and we'll see how it plays out there. But yes, uh, there is a trend in the rightward direction as there is uh, in our country and elsewhere. But I want to say that it's counterbalanced somewhat by this, this coherence that I think is super powerful. We have a question from one of our online viewers. So you mentioned European capabilities regarding short-range missile tracks. Are there any? Are there currently any U.S. deterrence tactics you can speak on? Is deterrence a higher priority for NATO or the U.S. than there is to coherence? Coercion, sorry. <laughs> yes, that's a, a really good question. I think there's all kinds of ways uh, countries can provide uh, a deterrent against uh, invasion, a deterrent against a missile strike, a deterrent against even bad behavior. And one of the most important ways now that I think NATO countries in Europe have to work on strengthening deterrence is by strengthening resilience. So talking about just the threat of missile strikes. And we're seeing in Ukraine today the multiplicity of missile threats from the very smallest drones very difficult to see on radar, very difficult to defend against, up to the most capable, uh, you know, inter not intercontinental, intermediate range ballistic missiles. And yes, Russia has been buying some intermediate range missiles from Korea, from North Korea, and, you know, shooting them at Ukrainian targets. So we've got some uh, great variety of missile threats against, uh, against Ukraine we can see playing out. That's a wake up call for NATO to put a lot of attention into integrated air and missile defense and building up missile defense capability so that the NATO allies can be resilient against these kinds of missile threats. And when they're resilient, then, you know, it's kind of telling the other guy, you're not going to get what you want if you launch this attack. So it's uh, it's something you should not even consider. So that's the that's the kind of message that I, I like to emphasize. There's a whole lot of ways you can work on deterrence. It's not all about building up weapon stocks. It also can be building your own national uh, resilience in many, many ways. John Gunderson. As a former diplomat, uh, having worked with the Soviet Union in Russia for 40 years, one of the most effective things we had was bipartisan consensus for 40 years and uh, bipartisan as well as European consensus. Oftentimes, it was the far left that disagreed with that consensus. And I can say that as a former diplomat, it's now in the far right, using the same talking points. Clearly, we have a bill before the Congress that addresses these issues. Without that bill being passed, the blood of Ukrainians is on, as a force ambassador there, I can say this, the blood of Ukrainian soldiers is on the hands of our own people. So what can we do in this room to affect that bipartisan consensus, maybe get that bill passed? Give us the magic formula. I wish I had it, but I will say I've been heartened in this conversation this morning and in talking to, to students that there is a real urge here uh, for uh, for democratic action, for working, and I mean democratic with a small d, that is working to ensure uh, elections are, are free and fair, uh, working to try to bring uh, uh, voting here to campus, as I understand, because election day is not... Uh, is going to be a day when when the school is not in, in session. So uh, 
I think working to strengthen our diplomatic practice and to ensure that we do have uh, the best possible representatives in Washington is, is one way to go about it. So I, I think that's very important, but also going with that, you have to you have to have savvy. You have to be aware of what the problems are, and you have to understand uh, the importance of trying to work uh, in the direction of of uh, bipartisan support for foreign policy. You know, in the not only in the Senate but also in the House, I understand the votes are there to pass this legislation in support of Ukraine, in support of Israel. And well, yeah, I think we probably also could have gotten that that bill on the border through. Uh, but the current bill that's before us is is foreign assistance or uh, security assistance, rather. And the votes are there. It's it, part of it is also the way that procedurally in in Washington, I think we've gotten ourselves tied in knots some these days by uh, leadership being able to tie things up. But then both sides get an interest in in sustaining those procedures and protocols, and, and that's uh, some complexity we, we don't need, believe me. But I don't have a magic wand to produce new bipartisanship, but I will say, behind the scenes, I know that there are a lot of people, even on Capitol Hill today, who continue to try to work issues across the aisle. And so your voice in saying that that's the way we need to go if we are going to be able to achieve anything as a country, I think those messages coming from this community will be all important. Uh, recently, we saw the ascension of Finland to NATO last year. Currently, we are about to probably have Sweden into NATO soon. How does that change the dynamic of NATO within the Baltic Sea? Woohoo! Um, no, I. You're right. I, I'm very much fingers crossed and toes uh, that this coming uh, Monday, uh, the leader of, of Hungary, Orban, has already said that there should be a vote in the Hungarian parliament in support of the ratification of, uh, of Sweden entering, entering into the NATO alliance. So that essentially, uh, to my mind, turns the Baltic into a NATO lake. And that's very, very important. Uh, the Russians, of course, have to operate. That's one of their major ports in St. Petersburg. That was that was uh, Tsar Peter the Great's big idea, right? To have that window on Europe by building Petersburg. And now, essentially, they've uh, gone about shooting themselves in the foot by basically shutting off the Baltic to, to uh, their easy access uh, for both military and trade purposes. Although, of course, I can't imagine the NATO alliance, as long as we're not in the middle of, of, uh, of conflict, sh uh, shutting off, you know, their, their uh, right of navigation for commercial purposes. I don't want to leave you with that idea. But in time of war, it's clear that NATO is going to have a, an advantage operating in, in the Baltic. And also, I want to stress one other point here, and that is that the entry of Finland and Sweden into the alliance is really going to bolster NATO's ability to fight in polar regions. When I was a deputy secretary general in, in 2018, we had a big exercise up in Norway, and it showed off the fact that, to be honest, NATO had kind of forgotten about how to fight in polar regions. And there were a lot of new NATO um, members who didn't really know about cold weather gear. They stripped all the sporting goods stores in Norway because they had to buy warm socks and gloves. You know, they just hadn't come with the right equipment from the countries in the, in the Bal Balkans, for example, or other places. It was a little bit of a joke because uh, some of the gra grannies and aunties in Norway started knitting woolly socks and handing them out to the soldiers on the roadside. So it's a simple and kind of a, a, a silly example. But in the end of the day, it pointed to the fact that NATO had to relearn how to fight in polar regions and having additional now NATO members from those regions, in addition to Norway, Iceland, and Denmark, having Finland and Sweden members of NATO, this is really going to bolster NATO's ability to operate in the, in the Arctic at a time when Russia is building up and modernizing their military infrastructure in the Arctic. So I think it's a very important strategic move, and um, I welcome it very, very much. <laughs> 
Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation and uh, insightful answers. Uh, looking at Ukrainian oper military operations over the last couple of months uh, makes me really worried that the likelihood of Ukraine being left without the U.S. help is relatively high. What is the likelihood, or uh, given this likelihood, I'm also worried that Europe will also have to deal with the Russian threat by itself without the U.S. support in the future. What can we do here? What could, what can diplomats, uh, State Department and the administration do right now to one, to ensure that doesn't happen and two, if it does happen, there is plan B. Yeah, I think the first and most important message is, is one that uh, I tried to convey with my, my remarks at the podium and that is our assistance to Ukraine is bolstering this remarkable, innovative, clever, and also fearless because they are defending their own liberty and independence, bunch of fighters. And this is a very important message, I think, not only to reflect on here as you think about the utility of, of our assistance to the Ukrainians, but also to convey in, in messages to representatives in Washington. This is not, as some have said in Washington, oh, we're just pouring money down a hole and it's not, it's not helping. That is dead wrong. In fact, the Ukrainians are making uh, extraordinary use of the assistance that they are receiving, and not only from the United States of America, but also from, from allies and partners uh, in Europe and also in Asia. The Japanese have been really providing a remarkable degree of security assistance to the Ukrainians. So that's the, that brings me to my second point, which is the plan B is that uh, the Europeans are stepping up to this bar themselves. And they are perturbed at some of the messages that Mr. Trump has spoken, uh, well, even here in this state a couple of weeks ago, uh, talking about, well, Putin can do whatever the hell he wants with the allies if they don't pay up. Now, you know, that was a message I heard a lot um, when I was uh, Deputy Secretary General of NATO, because Mr. Trump came for three summit meetings at NATO, and he was constantly pushing the allies to pay more for their own defense. And that was the right message from the president at the time. I supported it at the time. But then to say, as he's saying now, if they don't pay up, the, the Russians can invade them, can do whatever the hell they want. To me, that's mind boggling. And, and uh, well, uh, it's really irresponsible, but there are stronger words that may be said. But <laughs> The, um, the, the point is that the Europeans have heard these messages and they have been building up their own defense capacity and capability, not because of anything Mr. Trump has said, but because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022. And they've sent so much military capability and capacity, equipment, weapons, uh, different kinds of supplies into Ukraine that they've essentially emptied out their own their own supplies and they now have to renew those supplies they have to build up and modernize and for nato that's going to be a really positive thing because a number of the former warsaw pact allies the countries in central and eastern europe they had warsaw pact era equipment some of it 30 40 years old so they emptied out their their uh, stocks and sent those weapons to ukraine and that was great because the ukrainians could immediately grab them and use them on the battlefield. They know how to use that Soviet-built equipment. So that was great. But now the allies in Central and Eastern Europe are building up and modernizing, renewing their stocks with interoperable equipment built in NATO countries. And that is going to improve the interoperability, the ability to operate together of the NATO allies in Europe. And I think that will contribute if the plan B has to be the United States stepping away from NATO, and I'm not predicting that. I don't know uh, what would happen if Mr. Trump comes into office. In fact, I remember during the earlier period, his first term in office, in the end of the day, he was supportive of the NATO alliance. But if for some reason the United States stepped away, then I do believe that the Europeans are in a much better place today than they would have been uh, even five years ago. Thank you. We have two minutes left and we have time for one more question, uh, maybe from the webinar, Chloe. Uh, 
it's it's it disappeared from my phone. Go ahead. Use use. Oh, okay. oh you got it. Perfect. Do any of the track two strategies apply to conversations with our allies, uh, referring to the uneasy U.S. British relationships during and after World War II and into the Cold War? Are there still levels of distrust and mistrust that need to be addressed between the U.S. and our allies? Always. <laughs> now, the great thing about the NATO alliance, this is my experience, and also our allies in Asia, our ROK, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, we don't all see eye to eye. We have many, many differences, uh, political differences, differences of priorities and objectives. And so there has to be a constant discourse that goes on. These days, you know, there are active diplomatic and military channels open with all our allies, commercial and trade channels, even on a government to government basis, uh, trade uh, trade ambassadors. So I don't see the need for track two so much right at the moment, although believe me, there are always conferences that go on just because people have a need to sometimes sit and develop informal new ideas for policy. And that's an important way that all of you can contribute by becoming involved in some of these uh, young expert meetings that come up. It's a great way. And, and I've heard a lot of you are involved in like model UN or model EU. I think that's just terrific because it's the way, you know, you begin to hone your skills in building, building new policy. And believe me, we're going to need new policy. So we need all of you to be involved. Um, but uh, I will say that the, the notion of track two, where the government's aren't engaged and involved at many levels. I don't see that with, with the allies nowadays at all. Uh, it's very much track one with uh, all agencies of governments uh, being involved in those discussions. So thank you all very much. It's been a great uh, conversation for me all morning long. I really have enjoyed it. And uh, I wanna thank my fellow, my fellow speakers as well as you, Max, for a, a great, great conversation. Thank you very much, Rose.